church. Will you stand with me, please, as the fire comes down? And let's sing 314 in your songbook. 314, Stepping in the Light. 314, if you open your songbook, and let's sing Stepping in the Light. Sing with me, please. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior, shaping our lives. Blessed example, happy, how happy the song bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the On 314 on the second verse, pressing more closely. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the line. Stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk steps of the Savior, led in paths of, on the last, trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upward, still upward, all over God. to walk steps all right next page in the bottom corner I've decided to follow Jesus sing with me if you will a couple verses of this the same but the next page in the bottom corner I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided No turning back, no turning back, though no one join me. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Let's sing the last. The world behind me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. Turn back just a couple pages to 309. 309 and... This is a wonderful song for us to consider during this night. Is your all on the altar? It's a good place for us to start when we think about revival. 309. Let's sing it like a choir, okay? You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have mercy. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar in flame. This year all on the altar of sacrifice laid, your heart does the spirit.
verse number two as our last. Sing it out. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment? You must do his sweet will and be free. Ladies are going to play. I'm going to ask the ladies in the auditorium to be seated. The men, if you'll come and let's find a place at the altar and let's ask God to meet with us tonight and to anoint the preaching of His Word tonight and maybe even ask God to deal with our hearts about something specifically. So if you men will come as the ladies play. that we had the privilege to gather, gather together, and we had the privilege to hear the Word of God. We thank you for the preach that you brought to us, and Lord, you've given us strength and help and health so that we can be here. Lord, all of this in turn requires for you to work. Lord, we look to you. We exalt you tonight and ask that you would take control, that our hearts would be open that you, Lord, be magnified in our presence and do that lasting work. Help us, Lord, to trust you. Help us to have enough courage to set aside those thoughts and emotions and even change our mind, Lord, about perhaps maybe a lifestyle that we're living and that we would place our faith in you tonight and allow you to do a lasting, lasting work. We thank you. You're faithful and you're good and just. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing with me, if you will. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and say,
heaven and forgive their sin and heal. Well, I want to greet all of you tonight. It's especially grateful to have the Lester Baptist in joint service with us and Pastor, uh, Pastor John, Pastor John Reinhardt as well. We also have our guest speaker with us. And for just a little bit, Pastor Reinhardt will introduce him. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you, ladies, for the meal. That was wonderful. It was delicious. And the desserts were fantastic. And so tomorrow night, it's 545. I encourage you to be there. We'll have a dinner tomorrow night and then Friday night as well. No dinner on Saturday and we'll have nothing of this sort on Sunday as well. And so please be in supportive of that. We would certainly appreciate it. We uh, just want to encourage you tomorrow's service is at 7 and Friday at 7, Saturday morning at 10 o'clock and then Sunday we'll have an all day at 1030 and at 6 o'clock and of course a half an hour before the service is for the, the choir to meet and have practice and so please be aware of that. Uh, a few ones in our church here at Mabscott Miss Alma Mills came home today and so please, she, she's resting, but please continue to pray for her as they try to find answers. And she's recovering from uh, the stroke that she had experienced two weeks ago? Was it a week ago? About two weeks ago. So they just now discovered that. So please be in prayer for her. Brother Beckett was not able to come. Uh, he's not well, but he's hoping for tomorrow night that he can be here. Brother John, uh, Brother John Bragg found out that he has a he has a broken broken vertebrae in his back. So uh, he's here somewhere, isn't he? Brother John? He went home. Okay. So he was here earlier, but he's not doing well. So pray for Brother John. And the last thing I encourage you about is that there's an offer plate in the back we'll talk about it at the end of the service, but the offering play is going to, will be given as a love offering uh, for our speaker tonight, and so for all of us, be considered about that, if you will. Okay, stand to your feet. It's time for us to be happy, and uh, smile. This is the only time that you can be pretentious and fake. Just smile, walk around, and say something like, it's good to see you. I'm glad you're here. You know, I do that. And walk around as the music plays and greet one another for the service.
right, page number two in your songbook. Find page number two. Rather good to see you too. Page number two, sing on the chorus with me. Glory to his name. to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name page two on the first down at the cross save your time down where for cleansing from sin i cry there to my heart the blood applied glory to his name blood applied glory to on the last verse come to this so rich sweet cast my poor soul Savior's feet plunge in today His name, there to my heart. Page number 10, we'll sing one verse of page number 10, and Pastor Reinhardt is going to come and introduce our speaker. Page 10, one verse, Jesus keep me near the TV set. Sing with me, if you will. Page number 10 on that first verse. <laughs> It's all right. You're fine. Page 10. Sing with me. Jesus, keep me. everyone. You can be seated. Well, for Lester Baptist Church, I want to thank everyone here at Mabscott for the warm welcome and for getting to meet together like this. I have, I, I admit it seems really recent that we did this last spring and then to get to be together on the Sunday a few weeks ago and then to get to be together now, it's an encouragement and we had enjoyed the meal and I'm, I'm thankful for all the work that went in to make that easy for us. Well, my privilege is to get to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Nathan Dietrich, and I first met him, we think, we were talking together, we think it was in 2006, and I was teaching at a college in Wisconsin, and he came there to be a, a speaker for a conference that we had, and though he and I actually haven't been together since 2006, we hit it off, and I've counted him an acquaintance from afar, and someone that I really would have liked to have to been around. So, I'm really thankful that the Lord worked it out for Brother Nathan to be with us. Um, he is a, a 2000 and a, actually a 1998 graduate of Ambassador Baptist College. And his father was in the ministry for many years. I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about that in Missouri. So he's a pastor's kid. He's been an assistant pastor in a couple locations. And then in 2010, the Lord directed him to uh, start Crossroads Baptist Church, where he was for 13 years. And the Lord has blessed his ministry in a lot of ways. He also 
loves to speak about Baptist history. And um, I know that Saturday will be a blessing. I hope you'll carve out time to come and be a part of that on Saturday morning as he'll speak about the history of Baptists in the United States. So though Brother Nathan and I haven't gotten to be in person together very much, he's someone that I count as a friend, and I'm very thankful that the Lord has worked it out for him to come and speak to us. So you be praying for the Lord to work in your heart and to use him to give us what we need in this day. So Brother Nathan, you come. Thank you so much uh, to both the pastors, to uh, Pastor uh, Stalnaker and to Pastor Reinhardt for putting this together. Do you realize what a miracle it is for two churches to cooperate in something like this? I'm telling you, I've just been looking forward to this and excited about it uh, since Brother Reinhardt first called me. And uh, the fact that, that two churches uh, can get together for a meeting like this is a tremendous testimony. I was reminded of a man that uh, was deserted on a desert island years ago, and when they found him, there were three grass huts. Has anybody heard this one before? There were three grass huts, and they asked this man, they said, uh, what are the three huts? There's just one of you here, but there are three huts. And he pointed to one, and he said, well, that's where I live. Okay. And then the person said, well, what about the next one? He said, well, that's where I go to church. And then they pointed at the third hut and said, and what is that hut? He said, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> So all that to say it's a humorous way of appreciating what is taking place here over the next few days. And I trust that you have an expectant heart and that your business is, Lord, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to say yes. Okay, I'm going to say yes. And I promise you, you have a tender heart. And, you know, the Bible says that God pours out his grace on those that humble themselves. And we're going to consider much about the grace of God this week. And what, speaking of that, would you join me in the book of Ruth? The book of Ruth is the eighth book of the Old Testament. You start at Genesis and to go eight books in. It's the first book of the Bible named for a woman, the first of two. Another thing that's unique about the book of Ruth is in the middle of all the other books where it finds itself, it's only four chapters. You think about Genesis being 50 chapters, Exodus being 40 chapters, and on and on. Uh, you deal with chapters or with books of the Bible, both before and after the book of Ruth, that are uh, much, much longer. And yet, don't let the shortness of the book of Ruth deceive you as to its importance in the Bible's purpose purpose and picture. And I believe that we're going to get to see that this week as we hold up the grace of God. One of the great themes of the book of Ruth is the grace of God. As a matter of fact, you find that word several times used in chapter number two. And we'll look at that more as we move forward. I'll say a little bit more about the Baptist history uh, session on uh, Saturday morning. I'll say a little bit more about that maybe tomorrow night. But uh, I'm looking forward to that time. Uh, we'll maybe raise some questions uh, for you to be thinking about and uh, give you our best on Saturday morning, do our best to give you a, a big picture understanding of the history that we as Baptist churches have here in the United States of America. It's a significant history, and I think something that will encourage you. Now, let me just take a moment and ask you this question. How many of you, and, and be this is church, so be dead honest. Okay. How many of you don't really like history? Okay. Thank you. All seven of you. Okay. Normally it's the other way around. How many of you love history? You enjoy history? Good. Amen. Now let me ask you, and here's what I find out sometimes. I don't know, Brother Reinhardt, I know you teach history as well. What I find many times, Brother Marty, is that when I see a hand come up of an adult or a teenager that says, I just don't like history, I find a lot of times that goes back to a very boring seventh grade history teacher. Somebody who was as dry as last year's bird's nest and just wanted you to think, 
think about dates and names and didn't tie it all together. Remember that history is his story. Okay. And even as it relates to the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ that we call Baptist churches here in the United States in our 400 plus years of history dating all the way back to Jamestown, uh, there are some significant things that I believe will challenge you, will encourage you, will stir you to gratitude. So be keeping that in mind, our time together on Saturday morning as well. It's my privilege to be with you. I've been praying for this time. I know many of you have as well. I wish I could have my family with me. Uh, my wife's name is Grace, and Grace is Grace. That's why I like to talk about Grace. All the time talking about Grace. A unique aspect of our lives, Grace and I will in just a few days have been married only two years. Uh, I was married for 22 years to a godly uh, wife by the name of Jenny. And early in 2021, the Lord took her home after a 16-month battle with breast cancer. And she had a profound testimony. We saw people trust Christ as Savior uh, as a result of her sickness and her death. And it was a powerful testimony. And, and I'll mention back and forth, uh, just in illustrations and things throughout the week, I'm sure Jenny's name will come up, Grace's name will come up. Uh, and and I, I get him confused sometimes, too. Uh, so if I say one and mean the other, please don't hold that against me. Uh, but uh, God blessed me and Jenny with four children, and I have a 22-year-old daughter, her husband Micah, and uh, they have, no, not him, but I was just pointing at the mic I met before the service. He looked at me, well, not me, not me. <laughs> My son-in-law is named Micah, and that was a connection. Uh, and then I have two granddaughters, and then I have a 20-year-old daughter, a 18-year-old son, a 15-year-old daughter, and then... God, in order to help me in a unique way rediscover the fountain of youth, when Grace and I got married, I now have an eight-month-old daughter as well. So I'm just starting all over. Got grandkids and a daughter the same age. Uh, God's plans are unique, but I've learned this over and over and over again, that as for God, His way is best and perfect. And uh, we're going to see that illustrated in the story of Ruth. So let's begin with a word of prayer. You're in Ruth chapter number one. We'll begin with a word of prayer. And uh, then we're going to follow and, and develop over the next several services some important themes that, I, that it'll hit every one of us where we're living. And that's good. It's going to encourage us. It's going to strengthen us. It's going to challenge us. I'm praying that the Spirit of God will do a work of conviction in lives too. I'm praying that if you're someone here and you're sitting right here and if you and I were to have a personal conversation and I were to ask you, do you know you're going to heaven? And there'd be a big question mark come up in your mind. I'm praying that before this week is out, that question mark turns into an exclamation point. Okay. If you got doubts, questions about your relationship with Jesus Christ, where you're going to spend eternity, I'm glad to tell you there are a number of people in this room who would thrill them more than we can imagine to take a Bible, take you to a private place, and before this week of meetings is out, show you from the Scripture how you can become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone, just like you heard the choir sing. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we ask right here at the beginning for your blessing on these meetings. I thank you for the wonderful attendance tonight. And for those who have made the effort to come out, to be here, to bring themselves in humility and desire under the preaching of your word. And I ask in the remainder of our time together this evening that you would do a deep and an abiding work. I pray that even as we consider here at the beginning of these messages in the book of Ruth, as we consider Naomi and how she wandered away from home, from the Lord, and you and your grace brought her back, I pray that you do a work in lives of believers tonight, who even though they're here, sitting in this service, there may be an area of their heart where they've wandered away from you. And I pray that tonight there would be a determination, like the songwriter, to say, Lord, I'm coming home. And God, that you'd work in each of us in a, an eternal way, a transforming way, and I pray this in the name of Christ.
Amen. I want you to begin following along with me reading. We'll read verse number 1 down to verse number 5. We'll look at several other portions of chapter 1 in the remainder of the message this evening. But I want you to notice Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Uh, just a, a word here. We'll flesh this out more in following services. But how many of you know from previous information and interaction with the Bible that the time of the judges was not a good time in the history of the nation of Israel? The Bible tells us it was a time when there was no king in Israel and every man, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. A period in history of about 350 years, 350 to 400 years, where six downward spirals of apostasy were taking place among God's people, even after he had blessed them by giving them the promised land under Joshua's leadership. It was a dark time. Some might even say in Bible history, maybe the darkest of times in the history of Israel. And yet, we immediately get the historical context of the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled. And so here, as we will see developed over the remainder of our services, this beautiful picture of the grace of God working through Ruth and working in the life of Naomi and working through Boaz, who is an Old Testament picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even as we see this story of Ruth unfold, don't ever... Let it slip from your mind that this took place in the days when the judges ruled. When it was not easy to serve God. When it was swimming against the stream to do right. In the days when the judges ruled, that there was a famine, the Bible tells us, in the land. And we'll flesh this out more as we go. But remember this, in, in the, the history of the nation of Israel, and in God's interactions with them, generally speaking... When God's people, Israel, experienced a famine, it was an indication of his judgment. Okay, it wasn't always the case, but generally speaking, it was an indication they were not right with God. And one of the, the means of chastisement that God would send is a famine. And it's a physical famine of bread. And notice what the response is. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. You remember this. I'm going to give you a few definitions. Definitions are really important in names in the Bible. Bethlehem means house of bread. So here's a famine in the house of bread. Bethlehem, Judah, house of bread and praise. And it's a dark time. A famine has come as, as a, a manifestation of the judgment of God on his people who have turned their backs on him. They're not right with him. And so this man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. You remember that Moab was the illicit, the illegitimate son of Abraham's nephew Lot and one of his daughters. To me, it would have been one of the saddest identity crises in all of the world for a boy to not know whether or not to call his daddy, daddy or grandpa. Because of the wickedness. This is how bad this people, the Moabites, were. And so the Moabites are descendants of Moab. And in the country of Moab, this man Elimelech goes in a time of famine. He and his wife and his two sons. Verse number 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech. Elimelech means my God is king. Think about this. In a day when there was no king in Israel, a man whose name meant my God is king walked away. What a testimony he could have been. My God is king. I know there's no king around us, and I know that our nation is apostatizing and turning their back on God, but let me tell you, there is a king who is worthy to follow. There is a king who does not fail his people. There is a king who always leads his people right. There is a king who is a conqueror, a savior, and a redeemer. He could have stayed, but he didn't. And Elimelech, my God is king, with his wife Naomi, whose name means pleasantness, leaves the land of Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread and praise, to go to a place called Moab. The name of his two sons, Malon and Kilion. You may have a note in your Bible. Weakly and pining. One commentator said that Malon and Kilion's name, they, we could say their names meant icky and sicky. Okay. Icky and sicky. 
What does that tell you? Especially knowing that in the Bible, people, when they named their names, they didn't just search the list of the most popular ten names. There was a significant reason, and so it gives us a glimpse into Elimelech's and Naomi's heart and mind, if you would, their thinking, when we find them naming their boy Icky and Sicky. Okay. And so here are Malon and Kilion, Elimelech, and Naomi, and they're Ephrathites, the Bible tells us, of Bethlehem Judah. Ephrathites were the old families, they were the founding families of the city of Bethlehem. Judah, when under Joshua's leadership, the land was conquered. They're one of the noble families, one of the long-standing families. And so are you getting the picture here? One of the long-standing families of the tribe of Judah that God had promised clear back at the end of the book of Genesis, the kings of Israel were going to come through the tribe of Judah. Here is a family of that tribe who are an old, deep family, a noble family of Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread and praise. And the Bible tells us that in a time of famine, they left. The Bible tells us at the end of verse number 2, they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there. Did you notice the downward progression? The Bible says, first of all, they just went to sojourn. We won't stay long. Just go for a little bit. Then the Bible tells us next they continued there and they dwelled there. Have you ever heard the old saying, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay? And Elimelech and Naomi take their family and go from Bethlehem, Judah, to Moab, a picture of the world in the Scriptures, a picture of the people of the enemies of God. And they think it'll just be for a little while. And boy, their lesson still is shouting to us down through the generations the importance of staying in the place of God's blessing. Even if a famine comes. And by the way, one of the reasons that I personally believe it was wrong for Elimelech and Naomi to leave is because a man like Boaz didn't. Boaz stayed. Boaz understood that the thing for a, a follower of Jehovah to do was to stay and humble himself and to seek to influence others, to humble themselves before God so that the nation could get right with God and God's blessings could be restored. That was the thing to do. Verse number 5, And Malon and Kilion died also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. It's not a very bright beginning, is it? Now I'm glad, and, if you, and let me encourage you this, be reading the book of Ruth over the next few days. Read it. It takes about 15 minutes to read all four chapters. And it'll help you to, to get a grasp and to remember and to know things and recall things as we reference them in the messages over the next several days. But that is the dark beginning of a story that I'm glad to say gets better and better. Okay. Because everything turns, even though Naomi's a little slow catching up to it, everything turns with the beginning of verse number 6. I'm glad it turns that early in the book. But what we're going to do over the next several services, just like a diamond, we're going to hold up the grace of God. And it's multiple facets as they're illustrated and seen in the book of Ruth. How many of you heard the name Ben Franklin before? Yeah. Now, I don't believe Ben Franklin was a believer. He was personal friends with the great revivalist, George Whitfield. But there's no record of his ever making a profession of faith in Christ, as far as I know, unless I've missed that historical account. But Ben Franklin, as one of the founding fathers of our country, was a man who at least to a degree had an appreciation for the Bible that you and I hold in our hands tonight. During those period of ten years or so that he was in France seeking to garner relationships with France for our infant nation, he was a member of a literary club. And he went to a meeting one evening, <coughs> pardon me, of this literary club, and all they did the whole meeting was mock the Bible. There's nothing relevant in that book. It's full of myths and fairy tales, they said. Nothing that has any real and relevant value to life. 
That night, Ben Franklin went home and in longhand wrote out the entire book of Ruth and changed out all of the Bible names for modern French names. And he went back the next day, the next meeting, to this literary society club, and he said, I have something I want to read for you. And he read, word for word, the entire book of Ruth, just substituting the Bible names, the Hebrew names, for modern French names. When he was finished, the members of that club sat in awe. Astounded. They said, we've never heard a story like that before. The, the, the way that it builds attention and then resolves and all the love of the story and the sacrifice and the grace and all of the elements of the best kind of literature are there. Mr. Franklin, where did you get a story like that? Don't you reckon it brought him a great amount of delight to look at them and say, from the very book you mocked at our last meeting. And so here are just four chapters. We have one of the greatest stories in all the scripture, all history, of grace and love and mercy or kindness is a word that we'll see several times as well. And so the theme of grace, three times the word is used either grace or favor in chapter 2. Let me just give you a very basic working definition of grace. I like to say that grace is God's supernatural provision for whatever you need. It is grace. Grace is God's supernatural provision for whatever you need. Now let's take it just a little further. John chapter 1 and verse number 14. The Bible tells us that the Word, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, grace and truth. Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word of God, full of grace and truth. John would go on to say just a couple of verses later, and I love this, and of His fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. I heard a preacher explain that statement there, and grace for grace, of His fullness, of all we received in grace for grace, he explained it this way, it's grace for this, and oh, you've got that need over here, there's grace for that too. And you, you got this need over here, what need do you have? There's grace for it. Paul would say in Romans 5, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so this fullness of grace, this supernatural provision of God for whatever we need, the multifaceted grace of God. Peter would use the word in 1 Peter 4, 8, he would speak of the manifold grace of God. The, the, the many facets, the many folds of grace so that we can say tonight when it comes to the supernatural provision of God for whatever we need, there's grace for that. Whatever the, your need is. If you're here tonight and you do not have the assurance of salvation through faith in Christ, there's grace for that. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, Paul said. Paul would say in Titus chapter 2 and verse number 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. There's grace for our stand, our position in Christ. I've been meditating a lot lately on Romans chapter 5 and verse number 2 where the Apostle Paul says that we have access into the presence of God by the grace of God wherein we stand. The grace of God is the foundation of your position if you're a believer. It's like the atmosphere that sur surrounds you. In other words, wherever you go, you are in the envelope of the grace of God. Now get this. It is more than just an idea. It is more than just a, pro a, 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 a provision. I want you to understand tonight that ultimately, as we see in John chapter number 1, grace is a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's by Christ and His grace that you're saved. It's by the grace of God that we stand in our position. It's by the grace of God that we're sanctified, that we are brought along in that process of being changed into the image of Jesus Christ. 
I told uh, many times the folks that I had the privilege of pastoring in North Carolina, I described sanctification this way. It's the process whereby the Spirit of God takes the Word of God to change the child of God into the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and all for the glory of God. And that's God's intention for you. Not just that you get saved, but that you are in this process of sanctification, that you're cooperating with the Holy Spirit of God as He takes the Word of God and makes you more like Jesus Christ. And it's a cooperative effort. It's done by grace, but God doesn't do it in your life against your will. And so we're sanctified by grace. The Bible even says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 9 that there are times of suffering that come in our lives where we need to realize that the grace of God is sufficient. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He begged God to take it away. And God said after three times, don't ask me again, my grace is sufficient. Another facet of the grace of God. It's by grace, according to grace, that Paul said both in Romans and in Ephesians that we serve the Lord. Here's very practical use of grace or the place of grace in our lives. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29 and Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 6 tell us that we are to speak with grace. In other words, the grace of God is to characterize the words that I say. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is uh, good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the ear. Do your words minister grace in people's lives? Do they make people think bigger and better thoughts about the grace of God? Do they minister like Jesus' words would in a person's life? And so we speak by grace. Colossians 3.16, we sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. I was so encouraged by the singing tonight. No restraint. Nobody feeling like uh, somebody might be watching me sing. But just listen. Sing now like you're going to be singing in heaven. Amen. All the inhibitions are going to be removed. And there we are going to stand, get this, without any restraint in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. The Lamb of God on the throne. And all of the thoughts of what people might be thinking are going to be gone because all we're going to be thinking about is Jesus on the throne. Amen. And in grace... We're going to sing then. Let's sing that way now. We're strengthened by grace. The Bible even says that our sight for the future is directed by grace. It's by the grace of God that we're motivated to look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the importance of the grace of God. Grace is observable. Should be. Remember, our, our Pastor Marty and I were talking about this today. I've been thinking about this lately too. You remember when Barnabas went up to Antioch after that ch Gentile church and a bunch of Gentiles had gotten saved, <laughs> and uh, they started a church in Antioch, and they just did what you're supposed to do. People get saved, baptize them, you start a church. <laughs> And uh, the church at Jerusalem at the time, they were, uh, they had their issues. A good church, they had their issues. And there were people in that church that kind of had the idea that, um, uh, you know, if, if it, another church started, people are going to become Christians. They've got to become like us Jews. Us Jews Christians. So they said, we well, better check this out. And so what do they do? They send Barnabas up there. And I love it. Barnabas goes up. And it's a, a church of Gentile believers, baby Christians. And the Bible says when Barnabas got there, he saw the grace of God. Let me ask you a question. Can that be said about you? That when others interact with your life, they can see, man, the grace of God is at work in that person's life. Look at how they're changing. Look at their singing. Look at their, listen to their speech. The grace of God is observable. Now, now I want you to take, I want to take that backdrop, and we're going to move for the rest of our time together to the book of Ruth. And I want you to notice very specifically tonight this thought. That in the book of Ruth, the grace of God is observed in how it brings a wanderer home. Naomi and her husband had strayed from Bethlehem, Judah. We might say they had backslidden. They were away from the Lord. There were consequences that came be because of it. 
Do you remember the old song, Prune to Wander? Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Now, I can't speak for all of us tonight. But I'll tell you about this preacher, that there are more times than I like to admit that I'm prone to wonder. And I'm so glad for the grace of God that brings the wanderer home. I think about Luke chapter 15, and we we'll often call it the prodigal son. Let me just remind you, there wasn't just one prodigal son in that story. There were two prodigals in that story. And the hero of that story was not a prodigal son or an elder son. The hero of that story was the father. And his grace, he was looking for, planning for the day for that boy to come home from the far country. Already had the fatted calf ready. Has it ever struck you that the ring and the robe and the new shoes, everything was right there handy? The fatted calf was waiting. They didn't have to take the time to fatten the calf. It was already fatted. And all of us barbecue lovers say hallelujah. <laughs> but it becomes a picture. Luke 15 becomes a picture to us of the fact that when I'm wondering, when I'm prone to wonder to leave the God I love. That I have the assurance that in the grace of God, the Father is always standing on the porch watching for the Son to come home. It's significant that the Father ran to meet the Son. I might say a little bit more about that at another time. But I want us to briefly, in the remainder of our time together this evening, observe the grace of God at work in bringing Naomi, the wanderer, home. Four instruments that God uses of His grace. I want you to know the first. Notice the first one, and this is kind of counterintuitive, but we see it here. Do you know, number one, folks, that God uses chastening as an instrument of His grace to bring, when you and I wonder, to bring us home. His chastening. Naomi was away from the Lord. They'd fled a time of famine, which was a time of chastening. But God's grace found them even in Moab. Chastening came. Naomi's pedigree, as we've already mentioned, in the seed line of Messiah, in the seed line of the kings of Judah, an Ephrathite, one of the standing nobility families of the city of Bethlehem. And yet, those who should have been the most faithful, those who were the example in her case she left, you know what that tells me? That anyone, even the best of people, are prone to wonder. They made a choice. They paid a price for it. There was consequence that came. Great loss was experienced. And God, get this, not as a manifestation of anything hateful, but as a manifestation of His grace and love, He allowed a tool of chastening to be used in Naomi's life. A tool of His grace. As you think about the purposes of chastening in the Scripture, why does God spank us? Why does God allow chastening, discipline in our lives? Sometimes it is punitive. It's for punishment. And it's painful. How many of you have ever been there? And let me just, well, I'll mention this in a moment. But sometimes it's painful. But Hebrews chapter number 12 tells us, don't forget this, the author of Hebrews said. Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you? That's interesting because he then quotes Proverbs and Job. And yet the author, keep your hand here and turn to Hebrews. I, I want to, we'll stay primarily in the book of Ruth the rest of our time tonight. But I want you to notice something. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 5. Ye have forgotten the exhortation, the author of Hebrews says. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Now notice what the author says. He, sa he doesn't say to them, My son, or, uh, uh, you have forgotten the exhortation which was spoken unto Job which was spoken by Solomon to the people of his day. He said, You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you. You know what the author is saying here? Is that what was said to Job and what was said in Solomon's day in the book of Proverbs applies to you and to me. And that is this, is that when God chastens, He only chastens those He loves. 
it's a tool of His grace. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of Him. For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is He whom the Father chasteneth not? The idea is this, is if there's no chastening taking place, and the author would go on to clarify this, then you're not a child. Because God only chastens those who are His children. And it's a token of His love. And we could read further on down in the passage, but we find out that God does it to produce holiness in our lives. He chastens to produce holiness. He chastens to produce fruit and to bring about profit in our lives. There are many reasons why God chastens us. I believe there are times when God chastens us to prevent sin from taking place in our lives. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He indicates that he had a tendency to get proud about the visions that he had seen. And in order to keep him from getting proud, God gave him this thorn in the flesh. Purposes for chastening. To purify us. 13 times, 12 times, pardon me. In Ruth chapter number 1, some form of the word turn, return, or turn again is used. And it all translates one Hebrew word, which is the word that is used regularly for repentance. In other words, Naomi becomes an illustration to us of when you've gotten away from God, the solution is to return. Amen. Turn again. And over and over in chapter number 1, you find that word, return, turn again, turn again, return. And it's as if the Holy Spirit of God, from Naomi's example, is shouting down to us three years later, 3,000 years later, return, return, because there is grace that God has to pour out abundantly in bringing the water home. The tool of His chastening. But he always does. Remember, when God chastens you, he always does it as a father. I've had believers over the year come to, over the years come to me, and they would say, "Pastor, I think God's chastening me." I said, "How do you know?" And they're wondering. And you know what I've given? And, and this has been a help. It's been a help to me. I've told folks. I said, "You know, a good earthly father always lets his child know why they're, why they're being disciplined. He always lets them know if it's for sin in their life." And God's going to let you in in some way or another. He's going to let you know. And Naomi makes that clear. She knew where she needed to get right. But God uses the tool of chastening as a, a manifestation of His grace. My grandfather, when he was 12 years old, had an older brother, 19 years old, named Ernest. Ernest came running home one day when they were 12 and 19. Ernest came running home. He had just been in a fight and shot a man. Shot him in the arm. Thankfully not a fatal or life-threatening injury, but he shot him in the arm. My great uncle, 19 years old, who just shot a man, said to my 12-year-old grandfather, the sheriff's going to be here in a little bit looking for me. I'm going to be hiding in the back closet. Don't you dare tell him I'm here. Sure enough, a little bit later, knock on the door. The sheriff's there, and he said, George, where's Ernest? And my grandpa made a decision, even as a 12-year-old boy, that has had profound impact on our family. You know what he said? Ernest is in the back closet. Now, you can imagine that really enhanced brotherly relations. Okay. But here's what happened in the providence of God. In the chastening of God as a tool of God's grace, Ernest was convicted, spent time in prison, but in prison he got saved. <laughs> Isn't that great? He got saved. God called him to preach. And he pastored Baptist churches all over northeast Missouri. And there are literally hundreds of people who are going to be in heaven because they trusted Christ as Savior under the preaching of Ernest Dietrich. And by the way, he and George got along great. They're really getting along great right now because they're in heaven. Okay. But the tool of chastening. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. It's a tool of His grace. And I'm going to have to move quickly through the next couple ones here. A second instrument of the grace of God that He uses in, now get this, in bringing a wanderer home. 
bring the wanderer home is the communication of his word. Now here's where all of the book of Ruth really in a certain sense turns. Everything's been dark in verses 1 through 5. Death and desertion and destitution and you want a few more D's, right? But notice what happens. Verse number 6. Then she, that is Naomi, our subjects tonight, with her daughters-in-law, she arose that she might, what's the word? Return. That she might return from the country of Moab. Why? And here's what I want you to notice. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And everything turns right here. Here's Naomi, this old believer who's away from the Lord, who knew more about Jehovah than probably most people of her day did. But she had made some wrong choices with her husband, had gotten away from the Lord. And she's paying the consequences of it. God's brought chastening into her life, into her life. But he uses this chastening as a tool of his grace to wake her up. And Naomi comes to her senses and essentially says this, I'm going home. I'm going home. Verse number 7, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to... <laughs> Unto the land of praise, Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, and here's the wrong kind of return. And I'm not going to read all of that, this portion of the story, but on the way home, she begins to think about the difficulty that Ruth and Orpah are going to have back in Bethlehem, Judah. Because the Israelites didn't like the Moabites. And so she begins to try to talk her daughters-in-law to going back to a place of idolatry and immorality and wickedness. That gives us an indication of the spiritual temperature of Naomi, too. But now here, here's the good thing. She's, she's still got some issues, but she's at least on the way home. Amen. Listen, if you're sitting here tonight and, and the Spirit of God's talking to your heart and you know there's some areas of coldness and coolness and apathy in your life, some areas where even though you might be like the elder son and you're sitting right here tonight, you're where you're supposed to be. And yet you know between you and your good shepherd that there's some things that aren't right. <laughs> Listen, right there where you sit, it might be rough going, but just determine, I'm going to keep moving towards Bethlehem, Judah. Amen. Amen. I'm going to let the, the grace of God's chastening in my life do its intended work because He loves me. But the, the second instrument of God's grace is the communication of the Word. To me, it's a powerful thing that... All those miles away, I had the privilege in May of 2022 to being in the very area where this whole story is taking place, Bethlehem, Judah. And I'm telling you what, uh, uh, even though it was only 50 miles, 50 miles back then was maybe the equivalent of 500 now. When it comes to the difficulty of the terrain, you see the cliffs and the precipices and the steeps and the valleys. It was a difficult trip. They estimated that it would have taken about seven days. And yet God in His providence, I don't know how she heard, but she heard. And I want you to understand this evening that another instrument of God's grace in your life and mine when we're in the place of the wanderer is to get His Word to us. My dad used to say when he would pray, and there would be conviction that would take place. He'd say, don't get mad at the mailman for delivering the bill. Yeah. <laughs> it's the grace of God. Yeah. It's the grace of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Bible in Acts 20.32, Paul called it the Word of His grace. And it's an instrument of the grace of God. Every time... Your pastor, whichever one of these two men up here is your pastor, every time they stand and they preach the Word of God, something is happening. And I want you to get this is a supernatural book, and it will not return void, Isaiah 55 says. Okay? 
But I want you to understand that what's happening, even if it's chastening, even if it's conviction that happens, understand this. If the Word of God is being communicated, I want you to understand that it means that the grace of God is what is involved in communicating the Word. So that you can hear, even if there's a, a time in your life, a chapter, a place where you're alone or you're away or in an area of your heart and the Word of God is preached, it's God's way of t- telling you, hey, I visited my people, I've restored bread to the house of Israel, and there's plenty to go around. Amen. So communication. I love illustrations about the power of the Word of God. How many of you have heard the name C.H. Spurgeon before? Many of you have. The great London Baptist pastor. A man that God used powerfully, rarely, uniquely, in comparison to a few other men. Several times, he would be preaching, or even practicing preaching, doing a sound test, and somebody would overhear him just testing the acoustics in an auditorium. One time in particular, when they were meeting temporarily in what was called the Surrey Music Hall, I believe it had a lot of glass panels over it, he came in with several men from his church to test the sound out in preparation for the next service, and he stood in the center of the Surrey Music Hall and he cried out, John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And several times he just quoted John 1.29 in his preaching voice and shouted it out. Years later, a man came up to him and said, You don't know me, but I was a repairman up on the roof. When you came to do your sound check that day, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he said, I heard that, and the Spirit of God convicted my heart that I had never taken Jesus to be my Lamb. And soon after that, I found somebody who could give me the gospel, and I trusted Christ as Savior. And I just want you to know that Jesus is my lamb now. The power of the Word. Somebody asked C.H. Spurgeon one time, how do you defend the Bible as the Word of God? He said, about like you defend a lion. You just open the cage and let it loose. Let the Word of God do its work. And listen, when the Word of God is preached in here, Naomi hears... And by the way, let me just add to it what James says. Let's not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. So the communication of his word. A third instrument of the grace of God that he uses in bringing a wanderer home is companionship. We drop down later on in the chapter. Naomi's trying to talk Orpah and Ruth to going back to Moab. I want you to notice verse number 14. They lifted up their... uh, Look at uh, verse number 13. Back up to verse number 13. Would ye tear... Middle of the verse. For it grieveth me much. Do you see the word grieveth there? For it grieveth me much. Middle of verse 13, Naomi says, For your sakes, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back into her people and unto her gods. Return now after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. To leave thee. It's the idea of a, don't stand against me in this. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from uh, following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die and will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she, Naomi, left speaking unto her, unto Ruth. Now we'll look maybe in more detail at that statement or that confession of faith that Ruth makes in verse number 16 in particular, maybe tomorrow night. But I want you to notice that a third instrument of the grace of God that he uses in bringing Naomi the wanderer home is a companion, a loyal, truth-speaking, grace-giving, God-loving companion. A token of God's grace. One of the most significant tools of God's grace in Naomi's life was Ruth. Now here's a very practical thought for us this evening. I want you to determine tonight that you're going to be a Ruth in somebody's life. There may be somebody you know that's a wanderer, and they need to come home. You may not know they're a wanderer, but you be a Ruth in a person's life, a channel of God's grace. 
The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We are stewards of the grace of God. I, I have a responsibility to be a, a dispenser, if you would, a channel of God's grace in the lives of other people. And has the potential to have a profound impact. Determine I'm going to be a channel of God's grace in someone's life. I'm going to be a companion to someone so that God can use me to bring a wanderer home. And Naomi would eventually realize it. It's interesting that the testimony of the transformation. We'll look at this in a couple of nights. A couple of nights. The, the transformation that takes place in Naomi. You see this in the latter part of chapter number one. They, Naomi and Ruth come to the gate of the city. The city gathers around them. We'll read this in just a moment. And she says to them, "I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again, empty." Have you ever thought about what that could have done to Ruth's feelings? There stands Ruth, who's just turned her back on everything to come to a place that really offered her no hope because as far as she knows and Naomi knows, no Israelite man is going to want a Moabite woman. They're going from one kind of destitution to a worse kind of destitution in a certain sense. And yet Ruth has turned her back on all of it, cut all the strings. And here she stands, and yet Naomi says, I'm empty. But do you know what is amazing is before the book is over, we get to chapter number four. And after the whole story of God bringing Ruth and Boaz together and a baby boy named Obed being born to them and Boaz becoming the kinsman redeemer and rescuing them from their destitution, the Bible tells us that all the women of the city of Bethlehem said to Naomi about Ruth that Ruth is better to thee than seven sons. <laughs> Do you know what I say when I read that? And I know about my own need for companions who are channels of the grace of God in my life. My own desire to be a channel of the grace of God in someone's life. I'm like, God, give me companions like that. And help me to be a companion like that. Today I flew through the uh, Atlanta airport. And walked by a spot where I remembered an interesting interaction that took place several years ago. I was standing, I'd rushed to a gate to get on a flight to go to Greenville, and this lady came up next to me, and she saw these people standing in line, and she said, are all those people already getting in line to get on an airplane? I can't believe it. Why are they? And it was just, nah, 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 nah. Negative, I, and I, in my head, I named her Negative Nanny. <laughs> And then I said, I excused myself. I didn't want to be around her. I got up and I excused myself. Kind of went and got in line behind three ladies. And this one lady, you know how it is at an airport line. You just kind of merge in. And these three ladies kind of merged into line. And this one lady, it was, it, I wish you could have witnessed it. She said to those other ladies, didn't even know them. She said, girls. She said, my husband and I have been dieting for the last several months. And she goes, he eats a salad and loses five pounds. She said, I eat a salad and nothing happens. And she said, I decided on this trip I was going to reward myself. She said, do you see that Five Guys burger joint right there across the way? She she said, I just went and I had the best Five Guys burger I have ever had. And I mean, I don't care if it would have started raining right there in the terminal. Everything was great with this lady. <laughs> Do you know what I noticed? I found myself drawn to her. I wanted to just be by. I was just entertainment or entertained watching it. And you don't enter into a conversation when ladies are talking about things like that, you know. <laughs> But I just lit, and I enjoyed it. We got to the Greenville Airport, and it was the same thing. Negative nanny, nah, 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 positive patty. And she had a whole new circle of friends. You determined to be a channel of grace, and God will use you to help wanderers come home. Okay? And then number four, I'm going to give you this, and then we'll finish tonight. Another instrument of God's grace is the care of God's goodness. I love this. Notice if you would, verse number 19. So they went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass that when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, Naomi, call me Mara. The word means bitter. 
For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She's actually accusing God here of being bitter or resentful in how he's dealing with her. He's dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Uh, that word afflicted there uh, is the word that in other places in the New Test or in the Old Testament is translated evil. It's the basic word for evil. She's saying, God's been evil to me. He's afflicted me. Verse 22. So Naomi returned. And Ruth the Moabitess, there's that word again, and her daughter-in-law, Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and then don't miss this last sentence, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. And here begins a glimpse into this fact, the best is yet to come. I used to say, say to my kids when I'd read a story to them and we would get excited about how it was building to a climax, I would say it's getting better and better and gooder and gooder and sweeter and sweeter and pretty soon it's going to turn to sugar. I read that one day or said that one day after we had finished reading chapter 2 and I'll maybe mention this again. We got to the end and I said it's getting better and better and gooder and gooder and sweeter and sweeter and pretty soon it's going to turn to... And I paused and one of my daughters said, Marriage! <laughs> And by the way, it does. It does. And let me tell you this. It turns to one of the most important marriages that will ever take place in all the history of the Bible. But that last statement, they, they come home at the beginning of barley harvest. In the Mideast, harvest has two phases. It's actually the first phase, as I understand it, is just about to begin. It's April, corresponds to April of ours, and it runs for three months. The early harvest is barley harvest, and the second harvest is wheat harvest. Isn't it interesting to you that God didn't wait to bring them home to wheat harvest? He brought them home at the very beginning. Because in those three months, God is going to begin to open the floodgates. I think about Romans chapter 2 and verse number 4. Paul says to the unbelievers there, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, knowing not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. One of the biggest and first lies the devil will tell you when you wander away is that God's not being good to you. And God doesn't love you. But I want you to understand He's a God of unfailing goodness. He's a God of unceasing kindness. We see that in stories like the prodigal son coming home to his father. And so a final instrument of the goodness of God. And it just starts unfolding when you get into chapter number 2 and 3 and 4. And before it's over with, Naomi is going to be restored. And holding in her arms, get this, the continuation of the seed line of Messiah. Amen. And uh, I'll have to save more detail about that till another time. But I want you to think about this. God's grace in bringing the wanderer home. He uses chastening. He uses the communication of His Word. He uses godly companionship. And He uses the care of His goodness in, his li in our lives. I want you to consider, as we close tonight, Naomi's myopia, her nearsightedness, if not temporary blindness. As to the motive of God, the purpose of God, we read this in verses 20 and 21. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me, she said in verse number 8. The Lord hath testified against me. He's prosecuted me. He set up a courtroom scene and he's the prosecutor and I'm the defendant. And he's building a case against me. And he's afflicted me. He's being evil to me. With his hand and his dealings and his affliction, all that he's doing. In fact, I want you to get this. God was doing the exact opposite. He was doing the exact opposite in Naomi's life. Where she thought he was doing evil, he in fact was doing the best kind of goodness. 
as a token of His grace. She would say, I went out empty, but God... I want you to notice this. She said, I went out full, but the Lord has... We often fixate on the word empty, but the Bible says this. She said, the Lord has brought me home. Yeah, you may be empty, Naomi, but He brought you home. Amen. And let me tell you something good about coming home empty. Is it's His grace that fills you up when you come home empty. And that is exactly what happened. The same God who brought a wanderer named Naomi home will bring a wanderer here tonight home as well. And all is a manifestation of His grace. You maybe have been saved for years. Naomi had been a believer for years. You may be mature in the faith in so many ways. But even as you sit there tonight, there's an apathy. There's an area of your heart where you're away from the Lord. I want you to know tonight, it's the grace of God that is bringing you home as a wanderer. When my first wife, Jenny, and I were in a cancer treatment center in Mexico, we had the privilege one night at supper to sit across from an older couple by the name of Dan and Cora. Cora's body was racked with some kind of vicious form of arthritis. She was gnarled up and curled over. She could not even walk straight. She had to go down steps backwards because her body was so uh, racked up. But I have not met a couple that had a sweeter fragrance of Christ about them. We sat there that night, and they were just praising the Lord. And then she said, you know, several years ago, I wasn't like this. She goes, I nearly destroyed my family by my hateful, bitter spirit. I nearly separated my husband and I from our children because of my meanness, because of my greed, because of my carnality. And she said, and then God gave me this arthritis. And I got to tell you, my jaw dropped. Because I think that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody express gratitude like she did for something like that. But she said, God has used this to change me. And God used chastening to bring a wanderer home. And they were in the process of seeing their family restored as a result of her understanding that God was using that arthritis as an instrument of His grace to bring a wanderer home. Are you a wanderer tonight? Are you an elder son? Maybe you're a prodigal. Maybe you're generally a faithful believer, and yet there's an area tonight God's talking in your heart. I want you to know, listen, there is grace to bring the wanderer home. Why don't you do business with the Lord tonight? Let's make some decisions this evening about how God's working in our hearts. If you're here tonight, you don't know Christ as Savior, let us help you with that too. There is grace to bring you into the family of God. Father, thank you for your word this evening. I pray, Lord, that you would apply it specifically in the lives of everyone that is here this evening. I think of believers and however you're dealing in their lives. And I pray, God, that you'd give us wisdom in these final moments of this service before we close. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed in just a moment. The piano's going to begin to play to give us some background music. I wonder if there are believers here tonight. You'd say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved, but God's put His finger on a specific area of my heart where I need to get right with Him tonight. And in that area of my heart, I'm a wanderer and I need to come home. And God has worked in my life through His grace. And God's talked to my heart tonight. And tonight, I want to make that right with the Lord. Can I just see your raised hand so I can pray for you? Good. Several hands. Any others would join these? Pastor, pray for me. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. God's talked to my heart about a specific place, a specific area where I'm wondering. Thank you. You may put them down. I see another hand. Good. Several others. I wonder if there's anyone here tonight just by an upraised hand between you and me and the Lord. And Pastor Stalnaker is watching as well. And you'd say, Pastor Dietrich, I'm not even sure that I'm a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I got a question mark about where I'd spend eternity. And tonight I'd really like to see that turned into an exclamation point. I want to get that nailed down. And Pastor, I'm not sure 
about my salvation where I'd spend eternity. I'm not sure about my relationship with Jesus Christ, and I'd sure appreciate your praying for me. Anybody by an upraised hand, can I pray for anybody tonight that way? I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to see your hand so I can pray for you. I see a hand back here. Is there another one? Join this one. Thank you. You may put it down. Anybody else? Another hand over here. Another hand. Any others would join these? I see your hands. Anybody else? Several young people. Praise the Lord for that. Anybody else would join these? Father, I pray for all of these hands that have been lifted up tonight representing individual needs. Needs of believers, an area of their heart where they've wandered or are wandering and need to come home by the grace of God. And I pray that there be folks as they're physically able would do business even here at the altar tonight as we conclude this service. I pray for these young people that raise their hands not sure about their salvation. That Lord, whether tonight or in the near future, we would be able to talk to them and use your word to show them how they, even as young people, can become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Have their sins forgiven and know Christ as Savior and have the assurance of eternal life in heaven. God, would you do your work in our midst tonight as we conclude this service, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn the service over to Pastor Stalnaker. If you raise your hand tonight about God's work in your heart, and you need to come forward and pray, we want you to take the opportunity to do that. I'll be here at the front. If I can pray with you, Brother Reinhardt is here, Brother Stalnaker, others, if we can be a blessing to you and pray for you, pray with you as a friend, be a friend to you, we'd love nothing more to do that than to do that, to help you as a wanderer come home. Okay, if you need to be saved, you step out and come. We'll meet you, and we'll help you with that as well. Join me in standing, if you would, as the piano begins to play, Pastor. Okay.
Father, we're grateful that you have met with us tonight. And we believe that your word does not return void. And so we pray that as we drive home and as we prepare ourselves for the ending of this day, that your words would bear down deep in our hearts and souls and bring us, Lord, to that place of greater faithfulness to you or that place of repentance, that place of confession. We pray that we would expose ourselves and embrace the grace that you've given us. Thank you. You're a faithful and a wonderful God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been good. Brother Dietrich, I'm going to ask, if you will, to make your way to the back and you can greet folks as they leave. And I'm going to ask for one of the congregation, if you would consider to, to get some money and uh, drop it in the offering plate there in the back. It's just beyond the PA uh, table there and drop it in.